I'm Hannah Donnett with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Change is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE ADC Strategies Partnership webinar, which is titled, More Chemicals, Fewer Words. Exposure to chemical mixtures during pregnancy alters brain development. Our moderator today is Jerry Heindel, founder and director of Commonweal's Healthy Environment Endocrine Disruptor Strategies, or HEAPS. This webinar, is the, is, this webinar will be recorded. We will leave time following each speaker's presentation for a brief Q&A session. At the end of the webinar, we will open up the Q&A again for overarching questions and any, and any we did not get to in between presentations. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slide. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 90 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Jerry, to introduce our speakers. Okay, thank you very much. And hi, everyone. Let me add my welcome to our webinar today. This actually is a very special webinar. The study is unique and groundbreaking. Usually epidemiology studies examine chemical exposures during development, either a single chemical or a mixture, and then link that to some outcome later in life. And epidemiologists have been doing that for decades. But this publication starts out like an ordinary epidemiology publication by examining maternal exposures to EDCs and then linking them to effects in the offspring. But the authors didn't stop there, but used that same mixture in tissue culture and animal models to elucidate the molecular and functional impact of the exposures. Thus, really, for the first time, the concentration of chemicals in a pregnant mother were not only linked to an adverse effect in the offspring, but those same chemicals also showed effects in culture systems and animal models that strengthened the data from the epidemiology study. This is an exciting model and really I think could change the future of epidemiology studies. We're going to have four different speakers today. And it's important to note that this publication actually has over 30 authors and we will have four of the authors present the data. And my introductions are going to be very short, so you can find out a lot more about the presenters on the CHE website. So our first speaker is Dr. Carl Gustav Bornhag. He is an environmental epidemiologist, and he's professor and head of public health sciences at the Department of Health at Karlstad University in Sweden. And he's also a adjunct professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. His research focuses on early life exposure to EDCs and how they affect children's health and development. And he's the principal investigator for the SELMA study, which follows more than 2,000 mother-child pairs. And he will present the results of the epidemiology part of this study. The second speaker is Dr. Giuseppe Testa. He is a professor of molecular biology at the University of Milan. He is also head of the Center for Neurogenomics and director of the High Definition Disease Modeling Lab, which focuses on stem cell and organoid epigenetics. His lab spearheads stem cell and organoid-based models of neurodevelopment, focusing on genetic and environmental causes of chromatin dysregulation. He will discuss the results from the brain organoid studies, which use primary neural stem cells from the cortex of human fetuses. The third speaker is Dr. John Baptiste Finney. He is a professor professor at the French National Museum of Natural History in the Department of Adaptation of Living Organisms. 
He is the research, he leads the research team that focuses on thyroid signaling pathway disruptors. And he's going to present the results of the studies with the zebrafish and tadpoles, which examined the thyroid disruption and neurodevelopmental effects of the mixture, as well as changes in locomotion. The final speaker is Dr. Chris Jennings. She is the director of the Division of Biostatistics and a research professor in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is an expert in statistics with a focus on design and analysis methodologies for the study of chemical mixtures. She will apply statistical approaches that will link the epidemiology study data with the results from the in vitro and animal studies of the mixture and develop an approach for defining sufficiently similar mixtures and their effects. So with that short introduction, let's get started. And Dr. Bornhog, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, is my slide up now? I think so. So yes. uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this um, webinar. And um, I will uh, give a background to this study and uh, also present the main part of the epidemiological uh, data we have been using. Um, so first of all, uh, we are talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, and when we do that, we should keep in mind that this is a matter of early life uh, and, and sensitive uh, time periods during this early life development. That is uh, very important to remember uh, and one reason why we have designed the studies as we have been doing. And, and the point is one very major difference if you compare to traditional toxicity is that you have the exposure during sensitive phases in early life, but you can see the, the effects, they will be obvious uh, much later on. Uh, and this is, of course, complicating things uh, because you don't see an effect directly. You, you have to, to, to wait until later. And this is uh, uh, very often complicating the, the, um, the science of the, the studies we are doing. Uh, and we are, of course, very interested here then on exposure for chemicals, like exposure for environmental chemicals during early life and the importance for children's health and development. Coming into regulatory uh, uh, systems, we have for 100 years used animal studies for coming up with what we called reference doses. So we, we have some knowledge about human exposure, but then we use, and if there are concerns for chemicals, we have est um, established those response relationships and uh, these reference doses uh, can then be set. And what we have been doing for, for a very long time is to compare human, the human exposure with the reference doses. And if this uh, reference doses, if, if the human exposure is lower than the reference dose, then there is no problem. And this has been very successful. But one thing we should keep in mind is that this risk assessment approach have uh, always been based on a single compound approach. It means that we take one single compound uh, each time. Uh, the problem here is that when coming to reality, we know that we are never uh, uh, exposed to one chemical at a time. We are always exposed to very many chemicals. And this slide, you don't have to read the text, but what it's showing, it is from our Selma study. We have measured more than 2,300 pregnant uh, women, uh, what they have in urine and what they have in serum. And the interesting thing here is the red column uh, where it shows how many in percent of the women could we identify each of these chemicals. And you can see for the major part here, 
we could find these chemicals in all these 2,300 mothers. So we are never ever exposed to one chemical at a time. We are always exposed to complicated mixtures, but the risk assessment is based on the one single compound approach. And that is, uh, that is really a problem. What also is a problem in risk assessment, in traditional risk assessment, is that it has traditionally been based on very much on animal studies. Uh, nowadays, we talk to uh, very much to come uh, get away from animal models and uh, also include in vitro studies. But one thing which is very important for future risk assessment is that we also should use all the epidemiology data that is available out there. And in our dream, we see an interaction here that risk assessment should use all available information, both from human epidemiology, but also from experimentals in cells and animals. And so, so the simple thing is to use everything we have out there. And that is what we have be, been doing in this specific uh, project. So what we developed was uh, what we call a SMAC or a similar mixture approach. And this is divided into three, three steps or four steps in this case. But the, the first part, the green part here, is to use epidemiology. And the main, uh, the major aim with epidemiology is to identify what we call bad actors or chemicals concern in these mixtures that uh, pregnant mothers are exposed for uh, and identify bad actors in mixtures that are associated to some health outcomes. And then from that, compose these reference mixtures in, in step number two here uh, in, in mixing proportions that reminds of the human, how are humans exposed? And then the epidemiology part of this is over and we send these mixtures from step number two to the experimentalist and test these in different cells and animals, animal models. And depending on what kind of result we get there, we go into the red phase of this, which is the risk assessment. So what I'm going to show you here today is from the epidemiology part here uh, up in the green, uh, part of the picture, and then I will leave over to the experimentalists. So what we have been doing is that we have the SELMA study, which is a um, pregnancy cohort. We have been measuring um, 15 uh, endocrine disruptors in uh, early life of, of um, uh, in, in, in pregnancy, in urine and serum of the mother, 20 analytes, and we have been using uh, 594 families for these analyses. And then we um, um, examine the children and use data from a language uh, test when they were two and a half year old. Uh, so this is the base for how we uh, uh, set up the um, epidemiology study. And the overall aim here was, could we identify a mixture of chemicals in early pregnancy that was associated to language delay? I would say, yes, also that these language delay in this case uh, is that the kid at the uh, 2.5 years of age, it's actually, are using less than 50 words. And this is from a clinical point of view, uh, very much used uh, diagnosis or, or marker, because we know for sure that these early markers of language delay is associated to cognitive, defi uh, cognitive uh, deficits later in life. We have shown that in, in um, the Selma study, but it's also related to neuropsychiatric diagnosis like autism and ADHD uh, the later on. So, so the, the healthy effect we have been focused on here is very relevant. And this is what we measured in the urine and the serum of the mothers during the first trimester. We analyzed the urine for, for phenols, BPA and triclosan, and for phthalates from plastics. And we analyzed the serum for eight perfluorinated compounds. 
these forever chemicals that uh, seems to never be, be, they are extremely persistent and they uh, are accumulated in, in, um, in our environment. So then we have both the prenatal exposure of these 20 analytes and we have the outcome. So then we used um, an approach called weighted quantile sum. Uh, uh, and this is a way to uh, identify bad actors among, we had 20 analytes in the prenatal urine and serum. And the point with this kind of reg regression is to identify chemicals of concern in that mixture or, or bad actors for short. And we do that by um, estimating a, a WQS index uh, that is based on, uh, that is calculated from the, from the quantile chemical exposure. Uh, we can go into details uh, later on if you like here, but the point is that this, to find out if this, w, if we can establish a WQS index that is associated to the health outcome. And this uh, WQS index is then representing a critical mixture. And in that way, we can identify bad actors and we express the bad actors in terms of their weights or their relative strength to this WQS index. So the point here is to identify chemicals of concern for language delay in the children. And we did that, and this is the re result of that um, analysis. So first of all, uh, well, we, ha we had uh, a number of models. You can see the, chemi the 20 chemicals to the left in the table, and the upper part is showing uh, the WQS regression. And you can see we analyzed overall the entire group, and we analyzed boys and girls separately. And as you can see from the p-values, we could find strong and significant association between prenatal exposure for, for a mixture and the outcome of language delay. And then we selected the single compounds based on their weights. And, and this is a technical term that we used a threshold of, of uh, 5%, uh, because if all these chemicals uh, had the same importance for the outcome for the WQS index, then they should be at 5% but some of them were much, had much stronger weights. So we identified eight chemicals, either in the overall analysis or in, in, in the separated uh, sex. Eight of these compounds had uh, a weight above 5%. There were three more at uh, the lower part of the table here that had a higher weight, but they were not included in the final mixture because they're, they're uh, levels, concentrations in the serum was very, very low. So we couldn't um, find the mixing proportions for them later on. Okay, so uh, in the, the, then we have, then we, uh, the point was to establish a reference mixture to be used by the experimentalist. So to the left, you have the bad actors that have weights above 5%. And then we, you, we go back to the Selma mothers and uh, examine the uh, urine and serum levels of these compounds. This is a rather complicated procedure, but we, uh, because we had to transform the urinary levels to the serum levels. Uh, and then we had all the compounds based on a serum level. And then we could determine uh, the mixing proportion in percent of these bad actors. So here you can see that the highest um, uh, percent was for DEP, 27% of the mixture, and BPA was 4%, etc. And then we composed this reference mixture, and we made it in different doses, where 1x referred to a typical Selma mother for the mixture of these eight compounds. And then we used that 10 times higher, 100 times higher, and I think even up to 1,000 times higher uh, in the experimental studies. So this is then the mixing proportion. This is the same as I did show before. The mixing proportion of the reference 
mixture, which was sent over to the uh, experimentalist to be tested in animal and cell models. So the first part of the story then is that we could find uh, a chemical mixture in uh, prenatal urine and serum that was associated to language delay in the children. And we composed that mixture in mixing proportions reminding of a typical Selma mother and send that over to the experimentalists. So then I am ready here and um, I think I'm open for question before we go over to the experimental part of the study. Okay, thank you. So I, <laughs> I don't quite understand. Um, and I figure if I don't, maybe others. So if you start by looking at chemicals in the urine and the blood, and then asking which of those chemicals are related to the learning disabilities, then I don't understand why, why, why you're identifying which of them are the toxic chemicals. It seemed like all of them were. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of confused there from, because you originally said you measured, I think 15 chemicals in the urine and then you ended up urine or blood, but you ended up with just putting eight of them in this reference mixture. So I guess you're saying that of the 15, those eight were the ones that really were the most responsible for the effect that you were seeing on language. Is that right? Yes. Uh, just to clarify the 15 and the 20, we, we, we had data for 15 compounds, but for two of the phthalates, we had uh, more uh, metabolized products so so we we used 20 analytes uh, so for the and that was what we did put into the model when we estimated the association but the point is that the wqs regression is looking for a mixture of compounds that was associated to to uh, the outcome not the single compounds but when we when we selected the chemicals of concern, we took those that had the highest weight uh, for the WQS index. So the WQS was only used for identification of chemicals of concern. And that was eight out of these 20. Okay. The point that's complicated the purpose, for a non epidemiologist to quite no, understand but the, the, that, pur but. the purpose, the overall purpose with the epidemiological part was to establish a reference mixture in real life, so to say. So the experimentalist had something to test in their models. And the hypothesis was that we could find something in the experimentals that supported what we did find in the epidemiology. Yes. I, I understand that, just a little bit of the, the details. So in one other question related, uh, in the uh, adverse effect in the offspring, were there differences in the males and females? And was that important at all in making up your reference mixture? Well, Language delay is more common among boys. The, very many of the neurodevelopmental outcomes we are focusing both cognitive function, but also uh, neuropsychiatric disorders are more, much more common in, in boys than in girls. And that, so, so, and that was one reason why we, when we try to, when we search for, for chemicals of concern, we analyzed the full sample, but we also analyzed boys and girls separately because we know for sure that there are differences here. And that is typical also for 
endocrine disruptors, that, that associations that have been seen between uh, exposure for endocrine disruptors and, and neurodevelopment in children and also sexual development in children, there are always, most always differences in the association for boys and girls. Yeah. Which is rather reasonable if we are talking about the endocrine system in these uh, questions. Okay, here's a question. Were these analytes highly correlated? Did the regression yes. take this into account or how was this handled? Yeah. Uh, up in the, uh, this is just schematic, but, but uh, yeah. several of them are, of course, very much correlated. For example, if we measure several metabolites from DEHP, one of the phthalates, they are, of course, correlated because they're coming from the same uh, mother compound. But the WQS regression can handle that problem. That, that, that is one of the points here. Mm -hmm. So if this question is, in determining the reference mixture, the phthalates and their perfluorinated chemicals were measured in different kinds of samples, urine and serum. Mm. Do you think that this will influence the validity of the chemical proportions in the reference mixture? Uh, to be honest, <laughs> Uh, yes, because this is a really complicated question. How yeah. to transform, how to, how to, what we did was to go from the urine to an intake and then from an intake to the serum levels. And, and um, we are working with these question in another um, uh, European Commission project at the moment. And we are trying to develop these methods, but I can say for sure that this is complicated because you, you need a lot of information for doing this. And uh, I think uh, Chris Jennings can, can um, uh, know more about this than I do, but I know we have been struggling how, how to do that. It, it's not an easy task. So I think here's the, the last question. The set of chemicals is limited. Is it conceivable that you're measuring markers that co-associate with some other non-measured actual toxic chemicals. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes. And that observational studies always have that problem that we yes. do not control for anything. But that is, um, I mean, when we went over to the experimentals, you don't have other compounds. So we have a very good argument that since you will see results uh, soon here now from the experimentals, and they did find things that supported the epidemiology data. And that is an uh, evidence that it is not the case that there are other, other things that um, can explain the association in the epidemiology data. So yes. Okay, thank you very much. And now we'll turn the, the webinar over to the next speaker, Dr. Testa. Hello, everybody. It's a, a great pleasure to be with you today and to be with my colleagues with whom we have been spearheading uh, uh, this collective work, uh, uh, bringing together as a uh, Carl Gustav said uh, a number of disciplines uh, and approaches. So this is just, uh, again, uh, a summary of what you have seen, uh, which features uh, the disciplines that we combined together. I will be now focusing on experimental biology, just uh, the illustration on your left, uh, which uh, is precisely meant uh, to outline uh, the foundational disciplines which actually converged and uh, mixed themselves in this work about mixtures and the, the pervasiveness of these compounds, uh, which are indeed, uh, as you see from these uh, iconography parts uh, of our daily life. So uh, let me now get uh, to uh, the experimental part. And uh, indeed, uh, we uh, received uh, this mixture that had been synthesized in vitro uh, in order to uh, reproduce uh, a real life uh, uh, empirically determined mixture, as you just showed. 
and we decided to test it on uh, two uh, in vitro models. Uh, one was human fetal progenitor, so directly sourced, so uh, cells, uh, uh, cell lines that were established from developing human fetuses. Uh, and uh, brain organoids, which are instead that they derived from induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, the use of both uh, is uh, relevant insofar as uh, both uh, actually constitute uh, uh, close approximations of the tissue, in this case, the developing neural tissue, which uh, is arguably the target of uh, this exposure, given the phenotype that was called, many language the de de development. But there are some obvious differences in that uh, brain organoids uh, are a, a, a renewable uh, source of uh, experimental model because you can they, they derive them from human induced pluripotent stem cells or from human uh, uh, embryonic stem cells, and you can uh, have the, these lines grow and uh, actually they derive uh, in, in perspective uh, a vast number of. Um, of these uh, complex uh, three three dimensional structures, organoids that recapitulate in vitro uh, some of the key milestones of the development of the human fetal cortex uh, and some of the key properties of uh, these tissues evolving over time. Now, why is this important? Because of course, uh, in a project that was aimed from the start at uh, uh, innovating regulatory toxicology both in terms of the mixture-based approach and in terms of models such as this one that, that would more closely recapitulate uh, the actual uh, target uh, uh, tissue, namely the, 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 the developing human brain, it was of course very important to, to try and establish the validity of a new experimental model, namely brain organoids, which uh, is uh, re re replenishable over a source of, 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 of tissue, like for example, the cell lines coming from the fetal brain, which are inherently limited. And so what we did was to actually expose uh, both of these uh, sets of models uh, to the mix N at both uh, the concentration uh, that uh, was found in real life, the 1X or higher concentrations of 1000X, and we first of all found that these had uh, a severe impact on gene expression profile. You see here a number of pathways which were dysregulated. And we were of course not surprised that uh, these different models uh, showed the different pathways to be affected. And of course there were also some, some, some common pathways. Importantly, they related uh, to neurodegeneration and to cell cycle dynamics. And uh, we validated these uh, uh, and you see here the, the results. When we actually looked uh, at the balance between uh, proliferation and differentiation, which is arguably a hallmark of uh, uh, the dynamics that unfolds uh, in a developing uh, human cortex. And you see here, again, with these uh, two concentrations, the real life one and the uh, 1000 per, that the mix N caused uh, uh, an increase in uh, the Ki67 positive cells, namely, the uh, proliferating cells uh, uh, alongside the decrease in the DCX uh, expressing cells, which uh, points to an effect that actually favors uh, the proliferation of progenitors and delays or hinders the, the, the differentiation of neurons. Now, interestingly, this result, uh, and you see here below the quantitation, is fully in line with recent and completely independent observations uh, that were recently published uh, by the group of, of Matthew State, uh, which found that the hormonal exposure, especially estrogen, uh, intersects uh, the same developmental processes uh, that uh, regulate neuronal progenitor proliferation and neuronal durations as ASD mutations, namely mutations that are known to cause uh, autism spectrum disorder were found in this uh, high throughput study to actually intersect uh, uh, the same developmental pathways as those acted upon by hormonal re regulators, especially estrogen. So this becomes then uh, even more relevant in light of these results, namely when uh, we actually went further in dissecting uh, the type of transcriptional changes uh, that uh, mixen exposure caused. 
And, and we found several uh, genes that are annotated as bona fide causes of uh, autism spectrum disorder in the Simon Fa Fa Foundation Autism Research Initiative, SFARI, that were found uh, among the differentially expressed genes, both in the fetal progenitor lines and in the brain organoids. And uh, you see them, and you see them there. And we then went further and actually um, extended our analysis beyond SFARI. And uh, uh, we basically asked uh, uh, to which extent uh, the genes that were being targeted by Mixen in both uh, of these models, how they uh, related to a comprehensive list uh, of uh, uh, data sets that relate to neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, you see them maybe below, they, they are listed and, and they're basically the results of uh, the last uh, 10, 15 years of uh, very large scale consortia that uh, worldwide have been mapping the genetic vulnerability to intellectual disability and the autism spectrum disorders. And as you see from uh, these uh, uh, colored spheres, we actually found a, a significant overlap for several of them. So the message from this is that uh, the target genes in these two different uh, uh, and relevant systems of uh, neurodevelopmental toxicology, uh, of neurodevelopmental toxicology that we are now uh, presenting as relevant system for neurodevelopmental to to psychology, well, the, these, these target genes actually intersect uh, uh, well-established uh, genetic causes uh, of phenotypes that are obviously relevant to the specific phenotype that was originally scored in the Selma cohort, uh, and namely language acquisition and its delay. So with the power of evidence coming from human genetics, uh, we can already conclude that uh, this mixture is actually impacting and uh, derailing gene expression in pathways that are uh, causally very relevant. We then went further and actually asked uh, how specifically this dysregulation interacted uh, with the hormones that were already known uh, to play a pivotal role uh, in the human brain de development uh, and how it related to individual compounds of the of the mixture. So let me start with the, the thyroid hormone T3 that of course has a well-established essential role in brain de development and uh, what uh, we found when we actually uh, exposed uh, these uh, same uh, these uh, same models to T, T3 and to mix N we actually found that uh, as expected, uh, the mixture had a major transitional impact and had uh, and uh, had a pattern of uh, of uh, of uh, of this re of this regulation that was of course uh, very different than what was induced uh, by T3 in particular, and you see it particularly well in the organoids dataset, which is the one term CO CO stands for cortical organoids. We actually found that uh, the thyroid hormone T3 and MixN uh, uh, showed an opposite effect uh, on some very crucial genes, including, for example, uh, some proliferation related genes. Again, in light with what I already showed you on the cell cycle and the balance of proliferation differentiation being a target layer of function, as well as, as neurogenin 2, which was already shown to act. Uh, as a negative regulator of neo neocortical neurogenesis. So clearly there is uh, here a demonstration of how a mix N interferes with uh, uh, the gene expression regulation uh, by T3 in the very same tissue. And then we asked uh, what happens now when, uh, sorry, right. And then we asked what happens now with this A. So bisphenol A, bisphenol A is uh, you know, a historically well-established compound that was already widely reported to affect human brain development and behavior through a number of evidence, epidemiological in vitro and in vivo evidence, and which was for us a test case to actually uh, empirically answer the fundamental question that uh, Carl Gustav outlined be, before, namely, how does uh, the exposure to a mixture different from the exposure of individual compounds. And since uh, we already know, based on what uh, Carl Gustav showed you, that indeed in our daily life, uh, we are exposed uh, uh, pervasively to lots of these compounds, although each one of them, uh, at least in our country, is very often under 
the originally defined threshold of risk. Well, what happens empirically uh, that distinguishes the exposure to a complex mixtures from the exposure to one of its compounds, even one of, of those that has been best studied and that has been already shown to have uh, the most de detrimental impact. In other words, how much of the mixture can be attributed, can be ascribed to single compound and, and how much cannot. And so, uh, we probed uh, its impact uh, as a single compound, importantly, the very same concentration at which it was present in the one per mix head, namely the mixture at uh, the authentic real life levels. And we find that uh, while of course showing what we expected, namely a certain de degree of overlap, uh, especially in the brain organoids, we actually found uh, uh, a dysregulation that extended well beyond that of BPA alone. In other words, uh, this is the empirical demonstration that there is a clear purchase in studying mixtures because the mixtures, put simply, does something well beyond that of single compounds, even of uh, the best studied and most powerful compounds to date, like BPA. Which brings me to the final point, namely a point of uh, going upstream and in further mechanistic detail in this study, by actually inferring uh, through a process called master regulator analysis, uh, what are the transcription factors that were uh, most likely to be upstream of this dysregulation? In other words, uh, what are the relay factors downstream of the mix and exposures that actually control most of these uh, transcriptional dysregulation, which as I've shown you, intersect uh, so crucially uh, pathways of genetic causation of intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder. To do that, uh, we, we performed a master regulator analysis uh, using a very important recently released data sets that was also published in Science sci by the Psych and Code Consortium. Uh, and it basically annotates uh, uh, a lot of uh, human genetic variation that underlines uh, the uh, major neuropsychiatric traits. And we integrated these into a human brain specific gene regulatory network. And you see there on the left, uh, the pattern. So you see, of course, uh, the usual exposure, the, the control, the, the, the MSO, the 1X and the, and the 1000X. And you see the expression of the, of the transcription factor and the inferred activity of the corresponding transcription factor on the basis of the actual transcription landscape that we map. In other words, the question was given the transcription dysregulation that we observe downstream of mix and exposures, which are the transcription factors that are expressed in those cells and that move as a result of mix and that are most likely to actually uh, control that uh, that uh, this regulation we identified 92 uh, whose activity was most likely on the basis of this reasoning to impact uh, to mediate the impact of mix n and importantly this includes sox9 which is uh, well known to control uh, neurogenesis uh, and uh, uh, and we found also the down regulation of klf9 which is uh, again a thyroid d dependent factor which also plays a key role in neurogenesis and which uh, fits very well with what I showed you previously in terms of the antagonistic uh, uh, role of mix and vis-a-vis uh, the T3 mediated physiological re regulation. And uh, again, uh, uh, confirming that we found that when we now intersect, uh, as you see uh, in these overlaps, these transcription factors, uh, with the genes related to hormonal pathways, we actually find that the thyroid related genes were the most enriched, which was then uh, also uh, the uh, trigger for a, a number of further thyroid studies that you will now hear about from the next speaker, Jean-Baptiste Fini, in the uh, group of Barbara Delimi. So let me finish now with uh, the final slide, which is uh, simply a summary with a, a different graphics uh, that uh, again uh, shows you how uh, a regulatory system like the one that you see the, the, the depicted on the bottom right in which uh, you basically screen and filter molecules on a one by one basis 
is quite frankly uh, unrealistically suited to uh, a real life situation in which uh, the developing human brain is uh, uh, simultaneously exposed uh, to all of them. And so regardless of how carefully they may have been uh, regulated and filtered uh, at the moment of their individual uh, assessment, it is actually their, their combination that matters. So you see here just a different rendering uh, of uh, what Carl Gustav has already outlined, namely the motivation beyond our studies, uh, the steps in which we proceeded from epidemiology to the definition of the mixtures to its synthesis, to its uh, experimental uh, uh, dissection in human models, which are particularly relevant uh, to these conditions, also because uh, brain organoids in contrast to all other uh, in vitro models of human neural stem cells uh, are actually models that develop over time. So uh, one of the key points of this work is that we actually had the possibility to expose brain organoids uh, at a stage of differentiation of the developing human cortex, which was actually the stage uh, at which the measurement was originally done in the Selma cohort. And importantly that because of brain organoids in contrast, for example, also to the fetal progenitor cell lines that we used, since they actually develop, uh, they actually gave us the opportunity to keep the exposure chronically on the cells as they were transitioning in time. In other words, mirroring for the first time in vitro, the actual pattern of exposure that uh, we can infer epidemiologically from, from that measurement. And uh, finally, as you will hear from our colleague Chris Jennings, uh, the going back to the original uh, cohort uh, by actually asking after that, uh, we have experimentally defined and validated threshold of risk uh, or threshold of concern that are now actually attuned to the mixture effect. Uh, what can we say going back to the epidemiological data about uh, how prevalent was uh, an exposure to these experimentally validated levels of concern. Okay. So um, I will present you today the, uh, the part on uh, animal model testing of this mixture, mixture neurodevelopment, as we called it. Uh, so the work is, uh, was done by our uh, PhD student, Michel Limens, that uh, defend um, from uh, now. And uh, it was done in uh, Barbara Demenek's team. So for those who missed the beginning, uh, the idea of the, the whole uh, study was to um, make a link uh, between adverse effect in human and chemicals uh, that we are exposed to during pregnancy, because we know that in utero uh, development is a, in utero period is a really critical window of development because whole hormones are uh, making and, and playing some important role in cell proliferation. As Giuseppe highlighted, we, we have modification of cell uh, fate and cell proliferation when we expose that to chemicals. And uh, we know that, uh, that there could be different um, uh, ages where we have uh, the, 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 the outcome, the adverse outcome. So in another view, uh, to see the the study, uh, you had the urine and uh, plasma and serum samples that were collected during pregnancy, and then uh, different adverse outcomes uh, were examined. On neurodevelopment, the one that was uh, taken was the number of words that were uh, being said by the, uh, by the children at 30 months of age. And uh, uh, back to the samples, they were analyzed uh, as uh, CG uh, Carl Gustav uh, just explained at the beginning. So we end up with this mixture N0 neurodevelopment made of uh, eight chemicals. Uh, and as you saw, uh, the bisphenol A, four different phthalate metabolites and three perforinated compounds. We've tested that. So on cell system as uh, Giuseppe Testa just uh, showed you, but uh, we also uh, used with two partners, so one partner in Gutenberg uh, in Sweden, the zebrafish model, and we uh, used the Xenopus levis, so an amphibian model, uh, to test also this mixture. <laughs> we asked uh, two different questions. The first was, does the mixture have a thyroid hormone disruptive potential on the tadpole, and can the mixture uh, interfere with normal brain development? 
So we use the three-day exposure protocol. So it's a fluorine reporter assay, a XITA assay. So it's a Xenopus Eleutherio embryo farid assay. It's a no ECD validated um, assay. We also use the gene expression. So the collected brain of our tadpoles and um, make a reverse transcription of the RNA to be able to quantify gene expression. And also we did uh, some behavioral analysis, so both on Xenopus and on zebrafishes. So about the two first questions, I just want to uh, stress that there are many ways that uh, chemicals could interfere with thyroid hormone axis, but also with other hormonal axis. So it's not only on the thyroid hormone receptor. <clears throat> you, you have obviously this uh, mode of interaction with the chemicals, but we have to keep in mind that the, the globulins that makes the, the hormones vehiculated by bloodstream are very, very uh, targeted. We also have to uh, think about the fact that placenta is not uh, a complete filter. There are some chemicals and phthalates, uh, metabolites that could cross this placenta. And we also have uh, a need of hormones and particularly thyroid hormones during pregnancy that was not really acknowledged uh, like 20 years ago. So uh, just to make a why we use the Xenopus levis, we know that thyroid hormones are important for uh, trans, trans, transitions uh, and important transitions in life. For example, for a flat fish to become flat, uh, we need a peak of thyroid hormone. There is uh, also uh, a need for a metamorphosing uh, a, a tadpole into a frog and also a need for uh, some etching on, of birds and mammalian brain uh, maturation is uh, really dependent on thyroid hormone. The advantage of the Xenopus levis, but also the, the zebra fish that we used were the fact that we can use an uh, intractable, uh, intractable uh, stages in mammals using these, uh, these aquatic models. Another uh, important is that, so we have an XEXS and it's, they are metabolically, metabolically competent embryos. So, we, we use the, also the metabolites of the of phthalates, but we know that they are able to make some glucuronidation and some sulfatation as a mammalian system can do. And a, a fourth advantage that is not listed here is the fact that we used a, so animal model, but they are considered as 3R compliant because they are uh, still having some vitellus, so they are not... Uh, they don't need some uh, external food. So they are still considered in the EU, European Union legislation. So I don't know in the US, but as non-animal model, at least for the, for the laboratories. So, and uh, we can quote this uh, physiologist, Jacques Legrand, that said that without a minimum of thyroid hormone at the right time, a tadpole uh, failed to become a frog and the human baby becomes a cretin, as the cretinism was the the, the basal line that uh, thyroid hormone just to make, make, it, make it better, makes it better, sorry. Um, we used, so this uh, XITA essay, so the OECD uh, test guideline 248, uh, so it was validated in, in fact during the project. Uh, we started in 2017 and it was validated in 2019 by the OECD. The principle is quite simple. In fact, the, they are, uh, a tr there is a transgenic line, so the tadpoles are bearing an extra gene that makes uh, them uh, fluorescent when the, you put some thyroid hormone in the water. So here you can see uh, a tadpole uh, in, in a ventral view. So it's not the yellow fluorescence that uh, are, is important for us. It's the really the green one, because here you have this vitellus um, in, in the stomach and also, um, and also the gallbladder. So you don't mind, uh, you, you don't care about that, but it's the, the you, know, you can see the fluorescence is increased uh, in gills, in cartilage. So all the the tissues that will be involved and in, that will um, disappear during metamorphosis. If you put an EDC uh, with the same amount of thyroid hormone, you may see an increase, but most of the time what we see is a decrease of fluorescence and this we can measure it and it will just last for three days. So that's the important thing because uh, the actual 
uh, test guidelines for tier three level, tier three level uh, OECD test uh, are more about 20, 20 days. So we are using six well plates and it's last so three days. So the, the results we obtained with the <coughs> with the, the, the mixture. So we've tested the mixture at four different concentrations. <coughs> the actual concentrations found in human food. So the 1x concentration, 10 times more, 100 times more, and 1,000 times more. We were able to test it without uh, thyroid hormone. So here you can see uh, no, uh, so the basal fluorescence, the increase made by the T3. And you can see that there is no uh, effect on the basal level of uh, with, with the mixture. But what we could see was a uh, dose dependent decrease of the fluorescence with the increasing concentration of the mixture N0. And it was uh, quite surprising, but uh, it was quite efficient at 1000x concentration. So we were able to, to conclude at that moment that there was a thyroid hormone disrupting effect of this mixture N0. And uh, it was confirmed by uh, some RTQPCR and uh, targeted genes. Uh, so, for example, the two transporters, so OATP1C1 and MCT8, there are two uh, uh, um, membrane transporters of thyroid hormone because we know now that there is no passive diffusion of thyroid hormones. There is um, an active transport from uh, the, uh, the extracellular matrix into. Uh, into the cell, so with AOATP1 and MCT8, and what we can see that for some uh, samples and some concentration, we had a decrease with AOATP and an increase at the highest concentration tested. We were also quite um, uh, interested to see that uh, we were able to see this decrease uh, in expression of the thyroid hormone receptor beta or another transcription factor, uh, THBZIP, that, uh, so it's a BZIP leucine zipper. Uh, and it was uh, really uh, reminding us what we observed with the GFP quantification. So we were able at that moment, so we have tested uh, many other genes, but uh, we were able to, 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 to conclude at that moment that the thyroid hormone signaling pathway was uh, dysregulated in brains exposed to the N0. And finally, we were um, uh, interested in uh, looking at behavior and uh, what is uh, for aquatic models, the behavior is more on mob mob mobility. So we used the uh, for the tadpoles, 12 well plates. In the zebrafish, it, it was 48 well plates. And uh, we used a 10 minute uh, tracking uh, length. And it was an alternance of 30 seconds light on, 30 seconds light off. And everything was recorded with an infrared um, uh, video camera. So it's the Noldus system. It's named uh, Daniel Vision. And what we observe with the control animals is this. So the tadpoles are moving during light, light periods and they are not moving during uh, dark periods. So you can see an alternance of moving, not moving, and they get used to the stimulus. So the amplitude is a bit less at the end of the, the SA after 10 minutes, but it's quite uh, uh, always the same. We didn't see any uh, major difference with the, ex the uh, animals exposed to the 1x, but we could see uh, like a tendency with the increasing concentration of 10x or 100x. And it was uh, like a very important and very significant decrease uh, because the, the tadpoles were not responding to the light stimulus at the highest concentration. So we were able to see that the mixture at the highest dose was affecting the mobility. And um, one question about the, re about the reviewing uh, our, our article was the fact that, do we have uh, one chemical that is driving the response? So we also tested the bisphenol A that is in the uh, one very famous endocrine disrupting compound that was in the mixture. And we could see that bisphenol A was able to disrupt the GFP quantification at the highest dose. And you can see that uh, when we compare the response to the mix N0 and the BPA, uh, the BPA as uh, this, uh, so you, you have to reach uh, 10 to the minus four molar concentration, whereas you have this uh, N0 that is much more uh, effective at lower concentrations. 
and it was the same for the gene and the mobility. We had no effect of the BPA at the exact concentration found in the mixture. So uh, we uh, can conclude that the, the mixture associated with neurodevelopmental delay in children was disrupting the third hormone dissignaling, was affecting brain gene expression in two models, Xenopus and Zebrafish. So here you have the qPCR made on the same gene, TR beta, in the neurario. So you can see that there is a, a decrease and significant at the uh, highest concentration, 100x. And you can see that there were also a modification of the locomotion of zebrafishes. Uh, so the zebrafish model is different. So they move during uh, dark periods and they don't move with light and um, in fact the mixture was not uh, decreasing their mobility but they were increasing their mobility during dark periods but we have uh, common genes that were uh, um, uh, affected uh, in the two models. And interestingly, we found out that in some genes were very uh, common in our models and in the human fetal neural progenitors. So the, the, the work was done also with the two first uh, authors of this paper about comparing, in fact, the gene expression of uh, uh, the, the animal models and the in vitro models. But finally, it turned out that it was very much, much interesting uh, to see the, um, the gene that was reversed, as you can see here, Giuseppe already shown you, but I've, I've shown you that, but uh, you had uh, highly expressed genes that turned out to, turned out to be uh, repressed uh, with the highest concentration of the, the, the mixture, whereas you were, you had the uh, down-regulated genes that were up-regulated with the, with the, 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 the mixture. And uh, these uh, compared with the psych code, we were able to look at different uh, hormonal axes. So not only thyroid, but also androgenic, estrogenic, corticoids, uh, uh, metabolism, and uh, progesterone. We uh, made so the focus on the gen sets that were common in uh, our case, hormonal function. We applied a threshold and we made a network that is also uh, in, in the paper done with genomatics. What we found out that uh, you had uh, many genes that were affected by multiple hormonal systems, not only thyroid hormones. And you can see that you had some up uh, uh, with uh, estrogen. But comparing the number of genes, we found out that uh, the thyroid system was the more affected than just after the estrogen, PIPA, progesterone, androgen, corticoid, and retinoid. So conclusion, final word, uh, the fine tuning of hormonal system is crucial for proper brain development. We can see that and it's well illustrated with our um, in vitro and in vivo models. We uh, have the adverse effect of this mixture was identified from the epidemiological data and were validated in our models. And um, what we, we can think about a bit beyond that and about uh, there is no legislation on combined cocktail effects. So we were thinking uh, in the project during the project that we should uh, add a legacy chemical mixture because we have chemicals that we can't be, uh, we, we can't be, um, uh, we are uh, obliged to be exposed to, so we can't avoid them. So we, we perhaps we should use that. And we also started to uh, cohorts from cohorts to molecules. But finally, when you are building an adverse outcome pathway, you start from molecules to the population. And this we, we did, and we tried to do that. It's not on the AOP wiki, but uh, we wanted to come make our common results uh, on human xenopus zebrafish and make it to the, to the population. Because we have uh, uh, systems and endpoints on uh, each of these uh, um, key events. And finally, how to use this data on mixtures uh, in innovative risk assessment. And uh, I leave the word to Chris Jennings because she did a, a really impressive work in uh, using our data generated to be able to create new uh, risk assessment uh, 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 threshold. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, we could, we could uh, be uh, safe, safer with these models, uh, if we are taking into consideration mixtures, mixtures, sorry, and also uh, taking new new essays as uh, the one that we we exposed to you uh, with Giuseppe Testa. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, so I'm assuming you can hear me and that you can see my screen. So thank you very much for the um, opportunity to speak to you all. And it's been so much fun working with these guys. It's been a really interesting um, study um, that we were part of. So when you get to the risk assessment part, um, there are two, two sort of sides of that. One has to do with, are you gonna build up um, mixtures um, based on components? Um, or are you gonna start with whole mixtures? So the strategy might come from, if you've got sets of pesticides that you're interested in, you might assume that they're all additive, and then you would build up and try to predict what a certain mixture might um, present um, based on a, a model of additivity. The other side of that is if you're say, for example, sampling river water for disinfectant byproducts, um, you don't have a choice of component base there. You're measuring you know, a bunch of chemicals already together. But if you go and sample again, you're not gonna get exactly the same mixture. So the, the risk assessment sort of guidelines say, well, if you have a sufficiently similar mixture, then the inference that you um, um, observe or make from a single um, uh, mixture can apply to other mixtures that are sufficiently similar. So the work has to do with what do you mean by sufficiently similar and how do you test for that? Because clearly, as everyone knows, humans are exposed to multiple chemicals and not conveniently classes. Um, so we don't just, if you're looking at just pesticides, you're missing the fact that there are all other kinds of consumer products and things that we're all exposed to. And when it gets to endocrine disrupting chemicals, there are so many sources of that. We really need to think broader than just assuming um, additivity. So as CG showed, um, we have the similar mixture approach, which goes through, you know, from human studies into the um, very complicated and, and, um, and um, interesting um, in vivo and in vitro studies. Um, but the end of the day, what we want to do is to bring those back together and try to uh, make sense. And we're focusing on this um, similar mixture approach and testing for sufficient similarity. Um, so just as, as you've seen um, in, in earlier slides, um, the strategy in, in regulatory guidelines is to say, well, let's, let's start with human exposure, look for points of departure um, or regulatory um, guideline values from experimental evidence, and then compare exposures, uh, human exposures to um, some point of departure that you might get from an experimental evidence of toxicity. Um, if you have a single chemical, that ratio would be a hazard quotient. If you have multiple chemicals that you would assume are additive, you could put them together in a hazard index. But what we're doing, as you see, is we're starting with a more complicated mixture that has that's motivated by human exposure. And that's where we get to this um, similar mixture um, uh, approach. And so what we're going to create is something called a similar mixture risk indicator, which is very analogous to a hazard quotient where you take exposure and divide by a point of departure um, as evidence from the um, experimental evidence. Um, but we only do that. This, so there, I put this little asterisk here, right? Um, uh, we only do that if you've shown that particular people um, are sufficiently similar to the reference mixture, the reference mixture being the mixture that was experimentally observed. Whoops. So how do you talk about um, similarity, sufficient similarity? So um, we worked on this paper and risk analysis uh, with a dissertation student, Scott Marshall. Um, and I just want you to conceptually think about this. Um, there's a lot underneath this, but um, just conceptually, you can think about if you have a reference mixture, say, of chemical one and chemical two, let's suppose it's at, at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So it's 50% of chemical one, 50% of chemical two. So, but what if then you have a mixture that might be, you know, 60% um, of chemical one and 40% of chemical two, is that sufficiently similar? Is that mixture sufficiently similar to the reference mixture in terms of proportions, right? Not chemical structures and things like that. We're talking about just numerically from the proportions. Um, or you might have say a 30%, 70%, is that sufficiently similar? So the, the idea of this, of this um, approach is to say, well, let's, let's take a point on a reference mixture, say, say a point of departure or a, bis, a, a benchmark dose of a reference mixture. And suppose you had that benchmark dose on mixture one here, which say would be you know 60% um, of chemical one and 40% of chemical two. So what we can do is test the distance between those and, and come up with an idea of saying, well, are they sufficiently similar? So we've got to prove similarity. So we start by saying, well, what do you mean by similarity? And in this case, conceptually, you can think about having a radius 
um, or a circle around that point of uh, sorry the uh, benchmark dose for the reference mixture, and you're looking for a distance between those. If it turns out the um, uh, confidence interval of the uh, um, comparison mixture is within the reference or the similarity region, then we say we have evidence of sufficient similarity. So you're either in or you're out. And so it's a test statistic that's based on that. Now, what I showed there though, was the data rich case, which we described in that paper. The data poor case is more typical. And that is that we don't have experimental evidence on all these different mixtures. So we had to make simplifying assumptions. And to go into that, I'll, I'll lead you to the paper to look at that. And I'm certainly available for questions about that. Um, but really what we're doing is defining a distance between the reference mixture and the um, candidate mixture, the candidate mixture meaning what was measured in hum in a particular woman, you know, during pregnancy from the Soma cohort, right? And so we would do that. We're going to test each mother by themselves. Are they, is their exposure that we've got from their urine and their plasma, is that sufficiently similar to the mixture that we've experimentally observed? And we're going to do that by putting a confidence interval on that distance measure between those. And if that confidence interval is shorter than the radius that we define of that similarity region, then we say that we have evidence of sufficient similarity. So this is a, um, you know, we're gonna reject an hypothesis for evidence of something. So it's a, a sound statistical test. It's an alpha level test. Um, so it's got nice statistical properties. At the end of the day, then we're able to sort the women of exposure um, to either their, their exposure is sufficiently similar to the mixture um, or not. And for those that are, then we might create this similar mixture risk indicator, um, which is really just a, a ratio of their daily intake that we estimate um, or whatever units that we have here. It could be from an external estimate. It could be from internal values, how, whatever the, the metric, but they need to be in the same units. And we just, it's like creating a, a point of, I mean, a, a hazard quotient. We're just looking at um, the difference to that point of departure that we get from the um, uh, experimental evidence. So the details here are, you know, it, it, there's a lot of details here that I'm, I'm leaving out, but largely what we're talking about is um, starting with the mixture that you've seen, this mixture in, we've experimentally evaluated it. And based on what um, John Baptiste just showed, um, I'm showing here the Xenopus um, Zeta um, uh, assay. Um, so we have data, we fit a dose response model, um, we uh, have used the benchmark responses based on the um, uh, OECD guidelines of a 12% shift. Um, and um, so then we get a benchmark dose. We can certainly find a lower confidence limit on that. Um, and then we um, defined a similarity region just based on another 12% shift. Um, then we say that distance in terms of dose would be what would be our radius for our um, uh, similarity region. Um, and so then that gets us all set up. We can, um, under the data for, you know, we had to make some simplifying assumptions, which you can see in the Marshall paper, but um, uh, at the end of the day, then we can do our testing to see whether or not uh, we have, um, wait, I've got this thing on top of everybody. Okay. So now, um, when we do that zeta fish analysis then, um, which, which was nice as um, Jean-Baptiste showed, um, it is. It does follow OECD guidelines, so we didn't have to sort of search for what do we mean by a benchmark response. We could use that 12%. Um, but when we do this testing, the actual benchmark dose that was estimated um, using that that um, uh, assay was 14x. Um, so where 1x is typical, meaning it was based on the geometric mean of the exposures to uh, in the Selma cohort. 14x, that's not very high, right? That's where they started seeing this thyroid signaling disruption. If you put a lower confidence limit on that, 8x. This is really within human exposure um, levels. So when we do the test for sufficient similarity, we ended up with um, a lot of women being, most of the women being um, it's considered sufficiently similar. Um, and remember, we're starting in the middle of the distribution. So that's a lot of, of um, people you know, in that particular region. And we're going from distance from the middle. Um, and we end up with 96%. We're considered, we're determined to be sufficiently similar based on our um, strategy that we um, talked about. So, and then if you say now for those 96% of the women that are sufficiently similar to the reference mixture, 
we can construct a similar mixture risk index for them and put a histogram here. And you see the, the level of concern would be values above one. That would be values of, of total concentration for those women who are sufficiently similar to the reference mixture, but their exposures are high enough that their SMRI values are above one. And that ends up being 54% of the women um, that uh, were considered sufficiently similar um, have values above one, so levels of concern. So then finally, what we did is we said, well, let's go back to the Selma cohort and say, what if we use the SMRI as a, a covariate in a, in a regression model where we're looking for the uh, uh, language, the risk of language delay? Um, and that odds ratio um, using the um, SMRI, um, I think it was used yeah, in decile units, uh, had an odds ratio of 3.4, which was significant, 0.03. The, the point about the SMRI though is interesting because we could do the SMRI in another study. It doesn't have to be to go back to Selma. We could, we could figure out the SMRI values um, for women in another uh, study. Um, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for that. So the SMRI could actually be a metric that could be used to study um, changes in exposure um, after policy changes and things like that. Whoops. So the conclusion for the SMAC approach is that it, you know, the strategy is an objective and transparent approach. Um, now of course, you have to make assumptions about what do you mean by similarity and things like that, so that the, the science community can work on that to figure out what do we mean by that. These kinds of um, um, equivalence testing strategies are used all the time with FDA um, guidelines for um, generic drugs. So that needs to be extended now to the environmental health um, guidelines. We're testing for sufficient similarity. We've got sound statistical properties, so we require good sample sizes and things like that. Um, and as I say, this SMRI index can be used to monitor changes in, in exposure if we, if we wanted to set that up in some kind of a um, infrastructure for evaluating um, exposures over time and space. So in conclusion, then all of us together, um, as CG showed in his slides, um, exposure to a wide uh, spread chemical mixture of endocrine disrupting chemicals during pregnancy does, is associated with language delay. Um, we have human relevant concentrations and we showed disrupted hormone, hormone regulated autism and intellectual disability genes and altered behavioral responses in in vivo models. And what I've tried to show is that a lot of women in, in that Selma cohort then uh, who were considered sufficiently similar in terms of their uh, mixture relative to the reference mixture um, were found to be exposed to this um, level of concern. Um, so I, I went pretty fast, but uh, I appreciate your um, attention. Um, we do wanna, of course, acknowledge the Selma participants and um, our funding um, for both the methods work here and for um, the, the, the uh, EDC mixed risk funding that was um, the, uh, this paper was based on. So I can leave it here for questions or I can put us back in um, the view of paper, yeah. whatever people like here. Thank you. Leave this up for a few. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Denny, for your presentation. And then we can pull it down as we need to. Okay. Um, but yeah, we'll start with the Q&A. Jerry, do you wanna, I think we've got some questions coming in and feel free to put more in the Q&A as they come up. Jerry, I'll pass it off to you now. Okay, thanks. There are actually quite, quite a few questions now. Some of them are general. So let me start with this one. This is a fascinating study. What do you think are the most relevant opportunities for regulatory uptake of such an integrative approach via the AOP development only or via development of new guidance documents uh, at EFSA or ECA? Anybody you want, want to look at that one? What are the most relevant opportunities for regulatory people to use this? <laughs> I, I would say both. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, Chris, do you want to handle it? Yeah, well, I mean, we can all do that. I think the AOP thing is really important. But I also think, you know, that's what I was trying to say about this metric. I think we need to have metrics of exposure, metrics of risk assessment that we start looking at together. We shouldn't just be looking at single chemical uh, analyses. We might supplement current um, strategies for single chemical methods, um, but to have metrics of mixtures that are associated, clearly associated with health effects um, that we can monitor um, over different studies and over different locations and things, 
um, I think gives us an opportunity to show whether or not our policies are having an impact um, by considering the fact that chemical, you know, and, and we could look at all kinds of different mixtures to construct this. It doesn't have to just be the ones this mixture in, but um, so I, th I think that I, I would like for this kind of strategy, the SMAC approach and all that to be considered um, as a supplementary um, strategy for risk assessment of mixtures. I completely agree. And let me add that uh, indeed, I mean, uh, both AOPs and, uh, you know, new guidelines, because uh, I mean, first of all, this approach, uh, uh, I mean, what we have shown uh, is on the one side, of course, um, a rather sobering reminder of the type of vulnerabilities that uh, our uh, you know, model of development uh, is actually uh, adding to what is anyway the burden uh, of these types uh, of health outcomes. But of course, there is a positive and very important upspin, which is that we have demonstrated that such uh, a process is actually feasible. And so, for example, in terms of AOP, we can now actually define uh, AOPs also in these uh, new experimental models uh, that are now integrated into this seamless flow between human in vitro and uh, in vivo models between new toxicology and the classic established to to toxicology. And uh, uh, there should be, of course, uh, as uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Jennings wo was saying, uh, an awareness that since we have demonstrated that this is possible, uh, uh, you know, the epistemic unit of the mixture should figure prominently now alongside uh, the established regulatory to toxicology and uh, be benchmarked uh, through these studies and uh, hopefully many more to come uh, for uh, the entire pipeline of risk assessment. Let me also take the opportunity to say that uh, now in the Q&A there are also my colleagues Nicolo Caporale and Cristina Cheroni who are uh, among the co-first authors of the paper. So they are, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, they can happily engage with questions if same fit. Could I also just point out though the difference between the, the logic between using single chemicals to build up additivity models where you're assuming things are similar, you know, in terms of um, uh, chemical classes and things like that before you ever consider them in a mixture, compare that to the approach where we're taking uh, mixtures that are based on real human exposure. So we might have single chemicals that by themselves are not even in a dose level that you would show an effect but they're jointly acting, they're long an AOP instead of just saying they have, you know, the, the dose response curves or same mode of action or whatever. So that's, that's a, a different way of thinking to put chemicals together, but I think it's more human relevant based than where we've been with cumulative risk assessments and um, the structure of additivity. Okay, thank you for that. So here's, here's my, my <laughs> problem here. You know, in the endocrine disruptor field, we have been trying to get regulatory agencies to not just focus on guideline studies, to use academic studies. And for 30 years, we haven't really been successful. And now you're saying, well, we're gonna, we want you to look at epidemiology studies. So really, I mean, how much data do you think is going to be needed uh, to convince them that this is worthwhile. But can I just say, there's a lot of epi data now that are available um, for, uh, even publicly available um, for evaluation. I mean, there's the HERE program where now I think we have 24 different studies that are um, uh, uh, publicly available. In, in Haines, we've got data from humans. There's a lot of human data that's either you know, published or available for, for people to model themselves um, that really should be included in risk assessment. It's, it's not a very good thing when we're seeing guideline values that, um, where we're seeing exposures that might be below guideline values, but yet we're seeing frank, frank effects within our human studies. Um, that indicates to me our guidelines aren't yeah. low enough. No, ab absolutely. I think this whole approach is, is so terrific and it's, I hope that we can get a bunch of other people to uh, to repeat it, uh, uh, keep the keep the pressure on. All right, here's some questions. The linkage of specific developmental effects of the mixtures to a developmental molecular pathway or pathways is very exciting. Do you foresee that future prediction of yet unknown EDCs would be uncovered by testing? 
specifically for disruption at those molecular pathways? Have these pathways been linked previously to GWAS or other studies with certain other diseases that broaden your potential effects even beyond what you covered? It sounds like that's an, an effect for Giuseppe, right? A question for Giuseppe. So thank you very much for this question. If I understood it co correctly, but please co co correct me if I didn't get it entirely. Uh, the question is whether on the basis of this study, we can then extend uh, also to other health domains, uh, for example, through the, the, the intersection with GWAS. I would say yes uh, on two grounds. First of all, uh, let me also emphasize that this work uh, is uh, on uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes, but within this group uh, of colleagues uh, that are represented here today and our co collaborators, we have actually addressed, as Carl Gustav uh, also outlined previously, also other uh, 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 additional health domains, for example, sexual development and metabolism. And also those, we actually found mixture-specific effects. But your question, I think, is very relevant because you are basically saying, uh, can it be that uh, from uh, the gene targets that you have identified in this case, uh, you can now overlay those genes uh, and uh, the associated SNPs in the regulatory regions, uh, not only with uh, the neuropsychiatry disorders with which we did it and I showed you the data, but also with other data sets which may well have uh, relative uh, uh, comorbidities uh, with uh, uh, the same SNPs, and uh, I would say the answer is yes. And in fact, that's I think uh, a potentially very interesting uh, and productive way forward. So thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I may add uh, a comment on this question that I also found uh, uh, very interesting, uh, the part in which uh, um, you were asking uh, uh, if uh, we can build future prediction of uh, unknown uh, EDCs to be tested specifically uh, for disruption at uh, uh, molecular pathways. This uh, goes back to uh, what uh, uh, Cargus was also mentioning before about uh, the project that we are uh, currently uh, following uh, in the same network funded by the European Commission and in which we are uh, indeed establishing a systematic way to uh, use these experimental models to test uh, uh, different concentration of specific reference compounds, namely hormonal agonist and antagonist, so that we have a, a standard reference on to which uh, then uh, test uh, a larger batter, battery of uh, single EDCs or uh, even more importantly, mixtures of uh, EDCs uh, and, uh, and uh, find um, and associate them with the specific impact on the molecular pathways that we found relevant for the disease domain. Okay, so there are quite a few, uh, not real questions, but comments that just say this is so terrific and they really appreciate all the work, uh, all kinds of different approaches to just saying that. But there are a couple of ones. One thing I noticed too that it didn't really appear even in the in vitro organoids or in the zebrafish or the xenopus that there were any uh, non-monotonic dose responses. Is that true? Yes, it was true on, on gene expression. We, we were able to see a non-monotonic gene expression. So on all, all the systems, in fact, in, uh, in in vitro and human fetal progenitor cells on uh, Xenopus and on zebrafish. So it was on the whole zebrafish. But uh, we, we were able, for some genes, uh, to, uh, able to see uh, more expression at the lower doses. So uh, either 1x or 10x. And uh, no, no, ans no answers at uh, 100x and 1000x. So wow, that's really terrific, isn't it? Yeah, getting yeah. those lo low dose effects. Uh, let's see if there's. So here's one I, I don't understand, but you probably will. <laughs> How much did the SMRI approach alter explanatory power? So SMRI. I equals odds ratio of 3.4. What about with 
without SMRI. Does that make sense, Chris? It, I don't it, know. Do, it does. Make, <laughs> it does make sense, but I apologize. I don't remember looking for that CG. I don't know if you remember that. No, um, I don't. But um, the the model that that was in was adjusted by covariates. I don't remember looking for that, though. My apologies. Let's see. Do the presenters have any thoughts about the incorporation of a mixtures assessment factor into risk assessment to account for the potential effects of numerous known and unknown exposures to chemicals? This concept has been promoted by ChemSec and ChemTrust, and we want to see if, if you all believe that. In, in my mind, I think there needs to be a lot of different strategies that are put towards this. I, I think a mixture assessment factor can be, you know, especially if it's a data-driven mixture assessment factor, maybe that would be helpful. Um, but I think that could be helpful um, to address mixtures and risk assessment. But I, I think like, you know, what we're doing with SMAC is another way. So I think the main thing is we, we need to think about how to get mixtures more involved in various ways in our risk assessments. Um, um, and maybe the mixture assessment factor is an easy way to do that um, because it starts from single chemicals and then adjusts lower. Um, but mixtures are important. So here's the, the last question that actually comes from EPA. Any thoughts on how this approach could be used by the EPA regulators implementing TSCA? Because their focus is so much on single chemicals and First of all, you have to change them to be interested in mixtures. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, that's a tough question. I, I, <laughs> I think, you know, it, it, first of all, I think the EPA needs to be broader than just, you know, external exposures. I think we need to think about consumer products also with chemicals and things like that. Um, but, you know, you could actually identify a handful of different um, metrics that could be used in a lot of different places to see if you're, if you have an effect. Um, I mean, there, I think there just needs to be an infrastructure set up, maybe not one at a time for every sort of evaluation that's done, but um, where, where you could start looking at these uh, SMRI va uh, values across different populations or things like that. Um, I, I think it'd be fabulous to sit down with the EPA and sort of hash out some ideas about how to operationalize all of this. Mm -hmm. And we should remember that the purpose of this study was not to come up with uh, regulatory principles. The, the point with this study was to show that mixtures matter. And we did that by combining uh, observational data with experimental data. Uh, and 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 this uh, smack approach, but of course part of this could point in a direction. But the specific regulatory principles is that is a, a complicated and a, and a further question of this. The whole thing of mixtures matter really came out when you examined any of the individual chemicals. You couldn't uh, match. The effects of the mixtures really at all. Right. I mean, that is unbelievable. So, y'all are really changing the world here. This is such an exciting paper, and we're glad you took the time to uh, come and talk to us today. And let me turn it back now to Hannah. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. This is a quite a complicated study, and it takes a lot to be able to put it concisely into a presentation. So, thank you for taking time to do that with us. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available in Che's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing the link to the video. The next Che Alaska Partnership webinar will take place on March 30th and is titled Rever Reversing the Plastic Crisis Through a Human Rights Approach. To learn more into RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to Che and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive a new our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank all of our speakers, Dr. Bornahag, Dr. Jennings, Dr. Tessa, and Dr. Vinny, for taking time to present today. And to you, Jerry, thank you for moderating with your excellent moderation. 
Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing all much health and wellness and we'll be in touch soon.